The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, FIL Responsible Entity Australia Limited, AFSL 409 340, ABN 33148 059 009, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, Jamie McIntyre here. This ensemble series is all about the great wealth transfer. Throughout this series, you'll get insights from planners in our community and the team at Fidelity who have produced significant research on the great wealth transfer. I'm sure you will enjoy this series and get a greater understanding of how you can help in the great wealth transfer. Fidelity has been investing globally for their clients for more than 50 years and 20 years here in Australia. With one of the world's largest investment research teams, they conduct more than 20,000 company meetings each year to uncover unique investment insights that others may miss. Fidelity offers a range of Australian, global and regional managed funds and you can also access their investment expertise through our active ETFs on the ASX. Invest with local insights, powered by global strength. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Jamie McIntyre and I am the host of today's podcast. I'm a 25-year financial planner and specialise in retirement advice and I'm looking forward to today's podcast and sharing with you all the insights from research that has been completed regarding the great wealth transfer in Australia and share some insights into the mindset of clients. We have two guests today, Simon Glazier from Fidelity International and Harry Manceratos, our financial planner guest. A little bit about Simon. Simon is the head of wholesale sales at Fidelity International. He has 20 years experience across financial services. He joined Fidelity in March 2020 and is responsible for leading the sales and distribution team efforts of Fidelity International across the Australian wholesale market. In today's podcast, Simon is going to share with us the insights that Fidelity have uncovered in their research around the great wealth transfer in Australia and the opportunity for not only clients, but advisors and how they can help. Welcome to the podcast, Simon. Thank you, Jamie. Pleasure to be here. Our advisor guest today is Harry Manserados. He is a chartered accountant, financial planning specialist, certified financial planner, and SMSF specialist advisor. With his diverse skill set, Harry is able to think outside the box to ensure clients' financial positions, whether they be complex or simple, they are optimized. Welcome to the podcast, Harry. Thank you, Jamie. Great to have you here, Harry. And um, let's kick off with you, Harry. Um, Tell us a bit about yourself and your experiences with families you work with uh, that want to leave a significant inheritance for their kids. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm currently uh, my role here at Much More Than Money is a is as senior advisor. Uh, in addition, I'm the I'm a director and chairman of the board of Much More Than Money. We've got offices in Canberra and Sydney, um, but I've had extensive experience, a bit like yourself, Jamie, over 20 years uh, dealing with uh, various clients of uh, various complexity. And uh, inevitably, the topic of how what to do with our legacy with money uh, when we pass away uh, comes up as a discussion point. Uh, and uh, there's, there are some challenges in the discussions that you have with people. There's lots of challenges in the discussions we have with people, Harry. Um, I think that the nature of what we do, isn't it? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it sometimes can be a, a bit of an awkward conversation to have with people, just given the uh, wide ranges of backgrounds uh, and uh, cultural differences amongst groups of people. Uh, for some people, it's an easy topic to talk about. For some, it's not so easy. And uh, look forward to exploring some of those during our chat today. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think um, we'll be able to reference Simon in the research. And I, you, you insert the word there, cultural differences. Um, and prior to us jumping on today, we've, we've had some conversations about some of the experiences you've had in the cultural space. Uh, I'm still with you, Harry. Tell us a little bit about your experience from a cultural differences perspective 
in your practice with the clients that you've worked with? Yeah, for sure, Jamie. Um, look, uh, I, I had given it some thought and uh, I thought it'd be useful to just uh, give it a bit of an overview of uh, some of the differences. Uh, initially, one that comes to mind is as an elderly lady. She's in her late 80s. Uh, she's the, a widow. Um, her parents are German, but she's a child of the Second World War. And uh, her parents uh, were, were born and bred through the, or lived through the Depression. So a lot of her views of money, et cetera, uh, are affected by her upbringing and her background. We have a number of clients who are same-sex couples, and uh, I think that might be of interest to some of the listeners about some of the issues that come across and the thoughts there. Uh, couples in their 70s, you know, fourth-generation Australian husband, first-generation Italian background lady, New Zealand-born husband, uh, with the wife being Australian. There's an Asian lady who's single, has a son, and it's uh, very important to her to, her to leave uh, funds uh, to her son uh, uh, in a protected fashion. And, they, and a much uh, growing part of the uh, community across the last 20 plus years that I've been seeing is the blended family. You know, uh, clients who've been married more than once, kids from one marriage uh, brought into another relationship. What that means you now is when you're talking to a couple, uh, you're talking to the couple as, uh, and their kids as in the, directly from this relationship or what about the kids from other relationships? So there's a few uh, interesting case studies there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of case studies in there. I'm not sure we'll get through all of those, Harry, today. Um, and look, the, the term we've used is cultural differences and, and you used a word, I think it was different experiences in life was really what you were reflecting. You you commented on the German lady who's uh, come through the Depression era. So that influences the, the way she sees money, no doubt. And well, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about that German client and, um, you know, what her experiences are and how that relates to how she wants to work with her inheritance in the future. Yep. Uh, so with this particular lady, she's uh, she has she did have three sons. Uh, unfortunately, one of the sons uh, passed away in a motorbike accident maybe about eight years ago. Uh, the, the remaining two sons are in their 60s and they've got children. So this lady has ch- children, adult children, gra- grandchildren, also great-grandchildren. And because she's a product of the, of, you know, Second World War and the parents of the from the Great Depression, uh, she's always worried about that she's going to lose the money, that you know, money's going to disappear, etc. So, is her money going to last her her her, her, um, her life expectancy and beyond? Has always been a discussion. Reality is, she's got more money uh, from investments, etc., that she could possibly spend uh, across the years. She's been a little bit on the frugal side. That's got that which reflects uh, probably the upbringing as well. So she's been uh, careful not to spend a lot uh, uh, of the, the funds that she uh, th- did have, uh, but she's been also wanting to help her sons uh, in terms of getting them set up. One of the sons happens to be living overseas, and uh, one is living here in Australia. And the one living overseas, uh, she's provided financial support in different ways, etc. across the years. Uh, more recently, because of her age, she's moved into a retirement village. And uh, one of the lots, of, you know, discussions that I've been having with her was, uh, you know, well, what, does she want to see the ben- actual benefit of the funds before she passes away? So we started discussing uh, advanced estate planning. So as she was moving into a retirement village, uh, we've now uh, en- engaged. So I facilitated the discussion with a solicitor to uh, look to move property assets out of uh, her name into one of the son's name. That was a priority for him. And because the son that's living overseas uh, wasn't going to get use of it out of that asset, um, he, she's actually passed or uh, cashed in some of the investments and, and we've made allocations to him in advance. Uh, and, and there's more than enough funds to keep her uh, comfortable in her uh, remaining years as well. Yeah, and I think there's two parts that the research supports there. We've, we've talked about... Um, well, well, cultural differences in some ways, but also that nesting mentality um, that's quite common for people of um, this lady's age. Not that she's not because of German and the Depression era, but that you'd find that you get that a lot in Australia as well from Australian clients of, of that age group. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. So the, the the whole concept is it, will the funds that I have accumulated across my years last me till till the end, so to speak. Uh, 
uh, will I have enough money seems to be a common theme. Uh, although uh, what I'm finding for a lot of our clients who happen to be either affluent or perhaps in that high net wealth space, the reality is they, they just can't actually spend the money given their historical spending patterns, but they still have that fear of will my money last uh, across the years. Yeah, they've they've always had to preserve their money and be be protective of it because of their experience as well. Simon, what is the what is the research talk to? Oh, well, I suppose in a couple of ways there is that nest egg mentality and and also the cultural differences. Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion. And Harry, you make a great point about you know we're all products of our experience, uh, and that differs from people to people, right? And you know. This this nest egg mentality. Just to really briefly recap on the on the research, it was a survey of fifteen hundred Australians, uh, focusing across generations from the viewpoint of those part, wanting to pass on a legacy, but also looking at those potentially receiving legacies in the future and and what the preferences and what the perceptions of 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 that was. But four in five of the survey participants. Um, admit to having a nest egg mentality. So what so what does that what does that mean, right? And Harry, you made a great point, exactly right, that in the early in the early stages of retirement, there's a fear that we don't have enough money. So we underspend. We don't spend the money that we've saved in the accumulation phase in those early stages of retirement. But there's a tipping point for when you become a an experienced retiree, you shift from having that fear of of not having enough to then wanting to maintain a level to pass on. And that point of shift, that shifting point is different for every person in retirement. But this nest egg mentality is definitely alive and well in Australia, but it does change over time, as I say. Uh, And in terms of those cultural differences, through the survey, we found that those with Asian heritage uh, put the passing on of a legacy of higher importance, almost found it as their or thought it it was their responsibility rather than something that they would like to do. So there's an inherent kind of, I suppose, show of their experience and their cultural differences to the rest of us here in Australia and put a greater level of importance on on passing on that legacy to the next generation. But again, important to note that it is more than just money. There's cultural themes that, that they would like to pass on and quite often, it's more than just their super savings. So the complexity is definitely there, which is where a huge opportunity arises for for financial advisors. Yeah, I think there's some really great points in there too, Simon, to expand on. I like the terminology of experienced retiree, and I think I'll circle back and you can have a good chat about that one. But I think when we talk about nest egg mentality, the, most of the people in this nest egg mentality have come from a place of having no money at some point in their younger life. So the pain of not having money, I think it leans into them making sure they protect what they have or, you know, preserve it or whichever whichever words we might use there. And maybe my generation, the generations below, we haven't experienced that pain of, or, or as significantly as the prior generations. And the pain of not having money, yeah, as I say, is not experienced by the younger generations. Australia is a pretty wealthy country. Um, and if anything, the younger generations want to get their hands on some of that money a bit earlier, don't they, to happily spend it? Yeah, I think you're right there, Jamie. There's uh, there's a, a, an element of the, the people that uh, create the wealth there. They've uh, obviously sacrificed to, to do that. They spent less uh, than what they've um, earned. And uh, they've been prudent or wise in their investments, and uh, and so as they're moving into that retirement phase, they're they're keen to preserve and protect it. Uh, but then they they do look at the statistics that are coming through in our communities, where so many relationships uh, don't last the don't last the course of time. Um, you know, the advent of de facto relationships and uh, what that means to accessing assets, and uh, when people split up, you know, the splitting of assets. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of clients who, 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 as they've come to see me, they've come to see me and so it ends up being a hot button. The whole estate planning ends up being a hot button because they have helped their uh, child with, uh, uh, to buy the first property, so to speak. I need to see the, that relationship split or divorce and uh, you know half or more of the money go outside of the bloodline. And that ends up talking to strategies as to how you might protect the assets in um, 
it, upon death, you know, the use of bloodline trusts or testamentary trusts and the like, try and preserve and keep the assets in the family. Yeah, and that's probably a part of mystic mentality is is an element of control. Um, so it's not lost uh, outside of the family bloodlines as well. Is that fair to say, Harry, that that's a focus of the mystic mentality type of person? Yeah, that definitely, Jamie. The uh, you know, if they're worried about uh, what their kids might do with the money, uh, they're uh, infinitely more worried about someone outside the family uh, potentially accessing the dollars. So they're keen to typically do what they can to keep the the assets in the bloodline, um, and that in, that also talks to whether uh, uh, people want to uh, undertake what I call advanced estate planning, or waiting until the person passes away and then. They receive the assets. Yeah, Harry, how do you how do you encourage uh, your clients, new clients, existing clients, um, to try and break down their nest egg mentality to some degree and, and be in a position where they can give some money with a warm hand rather than uh, a cold half? Um, what sort of techniques do you use to encourage your clients to potentially give more whilst they're alive? Uh, Jamie, that's a good question. What what I find is uh, every client, we always have a, an initial and ongoing values discussion. So what's important to the client about money? What's important about life? What's important What, what what's important to them? And uh, over time, sometimes these things do evolve. Um, in, the, in the terms of the, the from a money perspective, uh, there's this term that I sometimes refer to as having sufficient money. And once people understand that they have enough resources, assets to provide them a sufficient income or uh, cash flow to fund their desired lifestyle, uh, anything over and above that becomes um, something that it's easier to have discussions around what they might choose to do with that money. And that then leads to uh, a greater openness to actually have those conversations to pass some of that wealth ahead of passing away or advance estate planning. Yeah. Simon, over to you. Give us a little, few more insights around um, the research and just a, some more general overview of what the research is telling us. Yeah. And again, Harry, you hit on some uh, really, uh, yeah, really interesting points. And I think that that notion of passing on a legacy with warm hands or a cold heart is, a, again, a really, a really interesting one. And through the survey, we found, and this is reflective of the nest egg mentality, that as people age, they're actually more likely to pass more of their uh, assets on after they pass. So again, this is almost like this hoarding of, of the cash, to your point, Harry, around sufficient money. Uh, it's helping clients, I think, understand what that is. Because if we look at some of the reasons why people would like to pass on a legacy, so you know, their thoughts and feelings, the cultures, what they want to actually pass on. There's a few points in here that have been that have come out through the survey that isn't about money, to your point. Uh, expressing gratitude and love for them. Like you can only do that with warm hands, right? Uh, that was that was called as the second highest reason for passing on a legacy. And it's and it's a, it, it's it's against what we're what we found in the survey that as we age again, we pass on more after we pass. So that, that discussion and constant checking and assessment of the reasons, you know, why you want to pass on a legacy and then what is a sufficient level of income in retirement is a, is a really important one. So it, it's quite an opposing view. So on one hand, you've got that nest egg mentality prevailing, but on the other hand, you, you want to experience the benefits of passing on whatever legacy you choose, right, while you're still, while you're still around. So again, it's not these things aren't, one size fits all. It's not set and forget, and it's different for every person. But obviously, money comes into it. the the primary The primary reason, or the the thing that best describes um, the benefit for passing on a financial legacy, is to give the next generation greater financial security, um, supporting them to get ahead in the property market. Right? These things are pretty clear, and we know. But the other underlying um, you know, thoughts and feelings are very strong in terms of why people want to leave a legacy. Yeah, you talk about um, sort of those conflicting things in there, Simon, of the nest egg mentality cohort in the sense that they want to give, but they 
what I'm reading into that is they don't know how to give and they need some type of intervention or, or some support or professional advice or working with a professional to help them figure that out. hundred percent. And even, even uh, if you think about and some of the survey responses from a cultural perspective, again, Asian, those with Asian heritage have a almost like a higher propensity to want to pass on a legacy but uh, are, are less have a have a less understanding of necessarily how to do it. Yeah. So in terms I, of a, I would I would echo that Simon I mentioned earlier that, that I have a late an Asian lady as a client and it's very important for her to leave uh, assets in a protected fashion to her son. She happens to be a, a lawyer uh, by profession and in her circle of uh, friends and family she's the she's the person that everyone goes to for advice. You know. Uh, and when it came to having discussions around uh, estate planning with her, um, it, it was a, quite a challenge for her to come up with. You know, if something happened to her, who would she actually trust to look up to? You know, the son, her son at the moment is, is age twelve, and so who who would be the right people to look after the money? You know, because all these people around her, they get her advice. But it's very 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 important that she has the right people in, in place. Um, and the right structures in place to look after, protect the assets, and leave it for her son. So I echo that research you, that you're talking about. And you're right, Harry. In terms of that example you gave about, um, you know, the partner splitting and fifty percent of the family assets going outside the bloodline, it's a reflection of the level of complexity that we're dealing with here. Uh, and and some of the other findings is in terms of that passing on legacy. I think half the respondents, or just under half the respondents, experienced something that changed the plan. Mm. So again, it isn't a set and forget. So whether that be a separation, divorce, an illness, or something along those lines, that complexity is there. But also, uh, in terms of the help required, and I, and I think about what had historically been in the in the realms of a family office, i.e., tax structures, fully fully established estate plan, that is now a requirement for most of us, right? That do want to pass on a legacy. So. You know what? What was what was a lot easier ten years ago, fifteen years ago, is not the same today. It, and on the topic of the cultural generational differences, uh, you know, I'm going back a few decades, but back in the '90s when I was at KPMG and I was doing my uh, professional year, becoming an accountant, etc. Across the years, we like I, I met and uh, we had a, a number of people join the firm who were from uh, you know multi generational. Uh, wealthy families, uh, Australian families, and uh, the thing that I and I still remember to this day was uh, uh, almost without fail they all were very uh, salt of the earth people. There were no airs and graces. The the, the families, uh, you just, if I mentioned the names, and I won't, of course, uh, but if I mentioned the names of household names, and you, you just knew they came from money, but there, there were no airs and graces. And uh, the car that they would drive, they, they, they took out a personal loan. They rented uh, in modest homes. Uh, any holidays, they, they'd fund it. And what the message that I got out of there, and, and I'll take it into today's conversation, uh, but you know, it was important for people to allow their children to uh, not declaw them, not take away the will and the, the willingness and the, the hunger to be successful in their own right by just uh, lavishing them with uh, wealth, if you like, you know, making things too easy. So, Jamie, to the point about giving things with warm hands is a balancing act of life time when you talk to clients. They want to help, but they don't want to help with a way to make it too easy for people. And um, and I'm happy to share some of the techniques that we end up using with that, uh, if time permits. Oh, look, Harry, I'd agree with that in my experience. It's not, uh, I suppose, we're using the word inheritance and a few other things. We're not really getting into the more specific detail. I, I agree with you. It's a small amount of the giver's money. It's um, it's going to make some impact in the receiver's hands with that warm hand. Um, and, you know, let's talk about clients that maybe for a a term that sit in middle Australia, right? They've got a little bit more than they need. I wouldn't call them their high net wealth. Um, and I think they all have the desire to underpin their children a little bit, but they still have similar desires to the high net wealth as well that they don't want to make it too easy for them either. Mm. They they need to learn from call it the school of hard knocks um, and learn from life experiences of what life kind of can throw at you. I want to stay in that for a moment, Harry. Um, tell us about some of those higher net wealth children of those families. And I want to dig into the mindset 
of those kids and you know what are the what are their expectations around what the future looks like from a future inheritance point of view yeah good good question uh, uh more often than not we'll uh, we'll end up having um uh, sort of family uh counseling sessions with so the the parents as an example might be the the main clients but we'll end up meeting the younger children or the adult children as well so it gives me an insight gives me a uh, opportunity to understand the the where they're coming from, et cetera. Um, and that also allows me to, um, uh, so the, the children are looking for uh, some financial assistance and the parents are in inverted commas happy to provide it, but they don't want it to go out of the bloodline and they don't want the, the, the children taking the, the money and uh, using it inappropriately. And and so the discussions that we, that I, we end up having sometimes is, um, I, I call it a bit like good cop, bad cop, you know, am I the good cop or bad cop? But, I'll often say to the parents as an example, look, what it sounds like you've got more than enough or sufficient money to help your son, daughter, etc. Uh, but rather than giving them the money, which is a historical thing, people give the money gift, perhaps what you should think about doing is actually lending the, your children money and they'll still have to go to the bank, borrow money to uh, buy the, the home or the property and you want them to feel the pain a bit. But you can lend them the money, and if you put a, the appropriate documentation, maybe have a caveat over the property. Um, they they can't sell the property and and take the money and and do something alternative with it. And if there was to be a split in the in the relationship, um, they can't take that share that money that you've lent. You know, you've got, you got security over the property, and that helps the, the parent and the child have a, a, be able to understand where each other's coming from. And I say good cop, bad cop. You know, sometimes. The, the the child might be have, might have a partner, life partner, son, uh, daughter, etc. But life partner, the life partner might be might get their nose out of out of whack, you know, hearing about that. Oh, they're not going to be given the money; it's going to be a loan. But that allows me to play the good cop, bad cop. You know, they can blame me as the the advisor. I'm the one that suggested doing it, but ultimately, I'm protecting the, the legacy, the money, keeping it in the family. That sounds like that's a pretty common strategy for you in high net wealth families. Uh, and, and not and and, and so called middle it is a high net worth strategy, but also it's uh, it's some of the most if people are wanting to if it's important for them to help their children. So this is a values discussion. You know they'll end up sacrificing something of theirs uh, to help their their children if that makes sense. So but they don't want to sacrifice it and see it go out of the bloodline. And it's like well how do I how do I do this? So they're looking just for common sense, plain English type solutions and. Uh, it, it can work for uh, middle uh, Australia as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and what about more around the mindsets of any of the, let's call it the children that you've worked with of of the wealth, whether it be high wealth, middle Australia, what, whatever. Um, what what's the sort of mindset of that Gen X, Gen Y that are likely to receive some money in the near future? Yeah, uh, a lot of them are, are tend to have the mindset of wanting to pay down debt so the parents want happy to help them to pay down debt um sometimes there's a discussion around well if we if, if you know if they're in a tight living situation uh perhaps in, a, in an apartment and they're young got they have young children the, the uh, receiving an advance inheritance uh would allow them to sell the apartment and get moving to a, a standalone house so upgrade the lifestyle if you like to be more comfortable with the young kids etc so there is this uh, constant discussion, if you like, or ten- a little bit of attention, but uh, coming up with the right uh, way forward in terms of w- what's the intention of the money. And as long as the parents can assess that it's not going to be used for any inappropriate purposes, you know, I'm going to use the, uh, the advanced inheritance to go for a round-the-world uh, trip and uh, blow it all, so to speak, um, the parents are generally happy to help the, the children. Yeah, I think that's a good um, a- Good segue over to you, Simon, talking to the Rainbow's End research. And there's an expectation that paying down debt will form a significant part of this great wealth transfer. Yeah, 100%. 100%, Joey. I mean, Gen Y specifically, most likely to distribute a windfall in the property. No doubt. It's sort of property and pay down a mortgage is daylight in front of any, any anything else. So that leg up in the property market, cost of living pressures is, is really evident through this through this survey. The other thing to note, I think, from Gen Y um, is is the preferences, right, about how to manage their finances. And there's a few there's a few call outs here which 
kind of leads to the conclusion that Gen Ys make great clients. And just the question around um, the way you prefer to manage your investments and big picture finances from a from a generational perspective versus Gen X and baby boomers, Gen Y have a higher preference to get involved but need guidance. So this is a do it with me preference uh, for for Gen Ys, absolutely. And then compared to the notion of would rather do it themselves, baby boomers and and Gen Xs is is well and truly up there in terms of their primary preference. So again, that's just sort of one aspect of looking at Gen Ys as a potential future client and the long term value. Uh, and the the other the other point to call and, and I and I'm keen to debate where we think this is this is coming from, but. You know, the question in the survey was, if you were to receive significant financial help or inheritance from your family, where would you rely on advice for what best to do with it? Top answer, professional financial planner. Now, my question maybe to Harry and Jamie is, uh, do you think that would have been the same 15 years ago? And what, what do we think has changed? Oh, well, you go, Harry. Uh, look, I, I've always been very comfortable uh, leaning into this area. Uh, I think it might, maybe it has do with the, just the background of being fairly comfortable with the tax and structures, etc., and uh, the understanding of tenants in common. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know what what it structures what the structures mean from an estate plan perspective. You know, family trust, super funds, death benefits, all that sort of thing. So, talking to people as human beings, I, I find that you know I was probably talking about estate planning uh, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. Um, but I, I do believe it's uh, it's become more prevalent just because of this uh, the understanding that there's this huge wealth transfer uh, happening at the moment, or is going to happen in the in the next decade or so. Yeah, look, I, I'm I'm sitting around uh, your question there, Simon. Of 15 years ago, where would people have lent towards going? Probably they would have started with their bank or their accountant because that's who they had the strongest relationship with. And we know how some of those starting with the bank conversations have played out for people over the journey. Um, so I think it's a really good, well, I suppose, a reflection of the work that's gone into the financial planning profession over the past 15 years to to be seen up at the top of that list because I don't think we would have been seen anywhere near the top 15 years ago. Um, and But it also, uh, some of the other parts of the research tell us that they aren't engaging with us either just yet. Um, and I think if you think in the context of that question of who would you approach if you get it, um, I think there's a bit of work to do with those that are giving the money and the children before the money exchanges or hands through death, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and we've been fortunate enough to have a few discussions since the release of this research where there are some great examples out there of a lot of businesses working uh, you know, with their clients and next generations across multiple layers of services. So it's it's really good. I mean, and on 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 the reflection for that for that survey and the response, you know, I, I think it's a measure of the impact that financials financial planners have in market too, right? So Gen Ys have probably been the beneficiary of seeing their parents live a, 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 a high quality of life in retirement. And that's been brought on or or enhanced by their engagement of financial planners. So, you know, I think as well as the level of financial education generally has been has been lifting. And, you know, I think I think I think we have a have a have a big a big role to play in that. And I think it's a reflection of that moving into a profession which is all very, very positive. I agree. And I, I think in over the last oh, I've been around twenty three, four years and the the internet was only kind of getting going back then. Um, and I'll use the word ind- industry now, not profession. The industry protected a lot of information. Um, and now it's it's all about sharing and openness. And, and that's probably a reflection of that answer that um, there's a, a lot of trust in financial planning now um, because we are open, honest and transparent now. And, and probably just one thing I'd round out before we sort of maybe kick on to the next point. I, I don't know how we go for time, but feels like we've been on for five minutes, but we've been on for a lot more. But just out the back of COVID, right, I think we all swung to digital. But again, one of the questions was around preferences um, in, ha- in engagement and communication. And across the generations, it's very clear that in-person meetings and face-to-face engagement is the preferred, definitely the preferred method. So 
I know there's a lot of discussions around AI uh, and that being the answer to a lot of a lot of problems out there. You know, given given the feedback, it doesn't seem to be the case. You know, but from a Gen a Gen Y perspective, again, it's important to note that the multifaceted approach to communication and engagement is very is very important. So these this generation will prefer in person meetings, but they'll need emails, they'll need phone calls, they'll need text messages, video calls work, chat functions work. So as a business, as we evolve and and really try and engage Gen Ys, it's important to have those multi media engagement platforms ready and ready to go. I I'd agree with that. Harry, I've got one more question for you, and I want to circle back to um, cultural differences or different cohorts of, of people. Um, and you mentioned earlier one, I'll call it a cohort, same-sex couples. Yep. Um, and uh, tell me a little bit about your experience with uh, same-sex couples and potes- potentially around either nest egg mentality or around receiving money. Tell us, tell us about your experience um, on that. Yeah, there's some some uh, interesting nuances that I'm happy to share. Um, look, 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 most financial uh, planners, advisors will uh, will undertake some level of modelling as an example. So as people are approaching retirement, if they're uh, so-called retirement age 60 or 65 or whatever, you know, the modelling will take into account uh, life expectancy. And uh, according to the life expectancy tables, if you have a male and a female who are both at, say, age 60 or 65, females are expected to live longer than males. Males, are, uh, generally speaking, tend to slow down in later stage in life. This has been very general. Females tend to be uh, fairly strong at, as it, and more active, if you like, in later life. And so with, it, an example of this, there's two ladies in their 60s who, when we looked at their estate planning, all the nest egg mentality stuff, if I've got enough money, will I have enough? Can, you know, should I work another year, two years? Am I okay? Will I be okay? That's, that's, that's very similar. But then when you're doing the projections, you're no longer just projecting. You're projecting for two people who are going to live longer than a male. You know, it's, it's the money does need to last longer. And um, so when you're looking at doing projections, as an example, you, you can't just go, oh, this is what I'm going, you know, I'm going to factor in. Um, of one might pass away. How can I say it earlier? The other one's going to expect it to live longer. They're both going to live longer. Um, generally speaking, because males tend to slow down, not all, but tend to slow down, uh, you, you can tend to you can tend to factor in a, a drop in uh, spending patterns, but if they're both female, their their spending patterns because they're still active and they're traveling, etc., and they're doing things, it, is, it tends to be higher for longer. So there are two nuances, if you like, uh, in that same sex uh, couple area that uh, some some people might not be aware of. Yeah, that was that was a really interesting eye, but for me, Harry, to just stop and hear you talk about that and and listen and think, oh, yeah, we'll do modelling, and uh, we've got the stock standard male female modelling, and having two females who are going to live for longer, that that brings a different overlay to your planning for them as well. Uh, and and look, you know, if the these days same sex couples, uh, and I'm familiar with a couple. Um, you know, can have children and they, they don't need to have a, a biological person of the opposite sex uh, to have a, a, a child, um, whether it's adopted or their own child. But in this, in this case, you know, they're, 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 uh, those uh, technologies were not around, those options weren't around for them when they were younger. So there's no children, so to speak. So their priority is leaving money to charity and discussing, well, who will be the trustee who's going to look after the funds after they both pass away and looking at things like the New South Wales trustee uh, looking after the funds and what charities, who's it going to be for and all that sort of thing. So some interesting discussions around that as well and the charging mechanism and cost benefit and whatever. So there's a whole stack of nuances there to uh, to explore. Yeah, absolutely. And I could explore a lot of things today with both uh, yourself, Harry, and also with you, Simon. Um, I want to, we're going to wrap it up and say thank you for some really cool input today. Um, we, we looked at different lenses. We spoke about cultural differences. We spoke about, spoke about nest egg mentality. And it was really great for me to hear the insights from you, Harry, who's a guy that's experienced across that accounting realm as well as the planning realm. And um, you've got a business that 
for me, it covers most areas. And, and I, I heard a theme that your clients like keeping money in the bloodlines. And I think that's uh, that's the right way to go for all clients, really. So thanks, guys. Uh, a great episode. Uh, I think we really dug into client mindsets towards the wealth transfer today. And, um, and thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you, guys. Good work, team.